Hey guys, and welcome back to Divine Journey 2. So there was no episode yesterday, but I did find a little bit of time to play. Let's first recap what's changed. First of all, as promised, I added these four extra powered spawners. This gives us Endermans, Bats, Zombies, and Witches. And I've also changed the way that we're handling these powered spawners. To save an extra processing step, we're automatically sending empty soul vials to be filled in the powered spawners, which then get output to their own soul binders. And then whenever we need, for example, the ender crystal, all we have to do is tell the ME system to put a vibrant crystal in here. And that will speed up the crafting and it means that the ME system isn't going to be looking for a ton of empty soul vials when we have slightly larger crafts to do. I've also made some changes over here next to ore processing and I've added this new drawer wall here. These drawers hold the output of both the nether farm and also the farm at the end. So since we have those powered spawners set up, we can now more easily craft ender chests, which is connected to our end farm. So I removed all of the drawers from here and everything now just gets filtered through this ender chest, including the output of our laser, which gives us iridium and also a little bit of draconium ore. The same ender chest and drawer network is also connected to our nether farm over here. So all of the drawers have been removed here and we now have this ender chest. And while we're in the nether, I also added another builder here. So we used to have the, actually the builder's been moved a couple of times, but <laughs> I did craft a, a third one I think this is. And in this builder we have the fortune card, which I think was actually in the dreadlands at the end of last episode, but that's also been tweaked a little bit, which I'll show you. But yeah, the output of this goes to the ender chest, and this has given us uh, nether diamonds, soul sand, and glowstone most importantly. Last episode we also made some decent progress through abyssal craft. And I've also changed our quarry here to a silk touch quarry and I also added the abyssal stone. The abyssal stone is going to be used in blood magic today and I also added pearlescent corallium ore to this builder. And you remember last episode we spent so much time farming these dread guards? Well we now have a powered spawner for these guys. As you can see though they do make quite a mess with their dread plague. <laughs> uh, it doesn't kind of hurt the frames a bit around here. But these guys are going to give us the shards of abyssal knight and since the only use for the shards is to be turned into ingots we have set up this transmutator over here which gets output to this compacting drawer i also just got finished uh, tweaking our applied energistic system a little so i've expanded our subnet and kind of rewired this controller just a bit make it a little bit cleaner and i've also swapped out all of the mainline uh, cable here with dense cable also i did go ahead and upgrade the rest of our alloy smellers and some of the, some of the other thermal machines that are around here as well and I've also cleaned up some of the spaghetti that was underneath this floor. There was some obsolete cables, so I've uh, run the cables a bit more efficiently to give us some more channels. But yeah, I'm really happy I managed to get some of these tedious projects done. And just taking a quick look at our ME system nowadays, we have many, many more resources to our name. <laughs> I don't think any of these basic resources is going to be a, any sort of an issue. Or at least I hope not for the foreseeable future. I did also increase the buffers on a lot of the alloys, like the Vibrant Alloy, Energetic, Lumium. All of that has been increased to, I think this is a full drawer. And some of the other more expensive ones, I've also increased to 512. So yeah, with those little projects cleaned up, uh, let's move on to what we're doing today, which is to start Blood Magic. So to get started in Blood Magic, we need a weak Blood Orb. To craft the Blood Orb though, we need a Dread Crystal. At this point though, these things are actually not too bad to craft. We have the blocks of Dreadium being crafted for us, and we have Automated Steam in Restonia. But we do need a few of these Oblivion Catalysts. So with the help of our sheep here, and some PE, let's make some Oblivion Catalysts. Which we can then craft into our Dread Crystal, but we have to wait for 20,000 PE in our book. And I think right now we're at 6,500? Yeah, so we need to let this charge up a little bit. To actually generate any LP for our Blood Magic needs, I think the only option we have right now is the Sacrificial Dagger. And while we wait for the book to charge up, I think we can continue down this side of the quest tree. So we next have to make the Hardened Blood Droplets. This looks like some sort of custom item. And we make this with Coagulated Blood. I think this was the same stuff we used for Baycock's Bloodied Stone way back in episode 2 or maybe 3. So now we have to use our Blood Altar, which has to be filled with Life Essence. And the only way to do that at this stage of the game is to sacrifice our own life. And as you can see, the Life Essence is going up inside the Blood Altar. And we need a thousand for this Coagulated Blood. And now we have our Hardened Blood Droplets. So this looks like it opens up the Alchemy Table and the Hellfire Forge. And we're going to need multiple of these things eventually. Actually, you know what, before we continue with any more blood magic, we're going to want somewhere to put our blood magic setups.
Alright, so I've laid out enough space to eventually have three different types of blood altar setups. These are 23 by 23, and then they are 5 deep, which is I think the dimensions of the max tier of blood altar. The first one we're going to use for LP generation, the second one is going to be for crafting, and the third one is going to be to fill our blood orbs. But I think it'll be a while before we can fill all three of these spaces here. I did also craft the first of many alchemy tables and weak blood orbs. So the alchemy table acts as basically a crafting mechanic within blood magic, and we need the weak blood orb to power this thing. So I think the next major goal for this episode is to automate all of the tier 1 essences. These are all custom items in this pack, and the quest absolutely recommends to automate all of these materials. So let's just have a quick look and see exactly what's going to be involved in the future here. <laughs> so um, we have Aether, Aquasalis, Incendium, and Terra. Most of these actually don't look too bad. I'm a little bit concerned about the gas tier, <laughs> but I mean a lot of the stuff we already farm yeah, I mean, most of it won't be too bad, it's just a matter of setting up the inputs. All of these essences, though, do require this simple catalyst, which is also an alchemy table craft. And I think all of these materials we're going to want on passive, as these are used in a lot of different places. I had a look through some of this JEI stuff, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they're used all over the place in custom items and custom recipes. So this step is going to be very, very important. But before we can get here, we need a way of generating LP. So I think we should look at upgrading our... Blood Altar to Tier 2, which is going to require Blank Runes. And the Blank Runes for the, in this pack take blocks of Dark Steel. So it's 6 blocks of Dark Steel each, uh, 2 Blank Slates, which is where the Abyssal Stone comes in. I don't think we can use regular Minecraft Stone for this, it has to be from another dimension. So let's put in some recipes here. Although yeah, I guess we'll need to start off by making some Blank Slates here. So the quest for the Blood Altar gave us these Resonant Fillers, which we can use to semi automate this process of making Blank Slates. So we have an input chest for the Abyssal Stone, which is getting collected by this Resonant Filler. And this is set to only allow one in the altar at once. Luckily this does only take 1000 LP, but I think we need at least 16 of these to upgrade to tier 2. Or 16 blank slates, which means 8 blank runes. But once we have our 16 slates, we can request our 8 blank runes. Which is, yeah, 48 blocks of dark steel. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we have dark steel automated at this point. But now we can build our tier 2 altar, which does increase the life essence capacity on our blood altar by default. But uh, since these are blank runes, we don't get any more buffs other than that. But now that we have the tier 2 altar, we can make the dagger of sacrifice. And instead of sacrificing our own blood, we can sacrifice mob's blood instead. And we got our dagger of sacrifice. Oh nice, it gives us 4 blank runes for that as well. Actually, after thinking about this some more, I think we're going to go the self-sacrifice route instead. So right now we don't get very much uh, LP for every sacrifice, however we can craft runes of self-sacrifice which do increase the life essence you get for every right click. And it can actually add up to being quite a lot of life essence that you can get from this thing. So yeah, I think we'll craft a few of these self-sacrifice runes until we can get the Well of Suffering and then fully automate the LP generation. So it's going to be a bit more painful to start and a little slower to set up, but once we get this going I think it's going to be better than doing the sacrifice dagger. To make crafting these slates a little easier in the beginning, we can set up a little redstone circuit here. So we have a comparator signal comparing to a strength of 5. And then I've switched this servo to only activate with a redstone signal. Which means that it'll only put an item in if it's above, I think it's 4500 life essence. Alright, so I've been doing a bunch of farming here for slates, and we managed to get up to the tier 3 blood altar. And in this pack I think it's the default altar caps, which in this case is glowstone. We also currently are using 6 self-sacrifice runes and two speed runes. The speed runes just speed up the, the rate of crafting when you're, when items are in the altar. But with the tier three altar, we can also make our imbued slates. So the imbued slates open up a couple of different um, options in terms of the runes we can use in our blood altar to augment it further. But I think at this point, rather than expanding our blood altar anymore, I think I would like to set up the alchemy table automation now. And we're at a bit of a tricky stage at this point since we can't automate LP. To be able to automate LP, we need to set up some blood magic rituals, which requires the activation stone to start. But these require a tier 4 altar and also lava crystals, which do require some Batania stuff. So yeah, it's going to be a couple of chapters before we can automate LP. So for the time being, I think we're stuck with the sacrificial dagger. But to start, as I mentioned, we're going to start with the tier 1 essences, and I think there's also the, yeah, the tier 2 over here as well. We want to automate those, so this episode I would like to at least get these two things automated. Which sounds easy, but <laughs> there's a lot of steps to do this. So first of all, we have to create enough alchemy tables. 
As you can see, there are 27 pages of recipes here, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to have one alchemy table for every single recipe. There's a couple of here that are kind of obsolete, like the gunpowder. We don't need to automate this this way. So I think we'll just start with five for now. We'll have one for each of the essences here, and then also one for the simple catalysts. So I did make some more blood droplets. I'm curious if we can request five of these things. Oh, we can. Okay. Yes, yeah, 60 blocks of dark steel though. Alright, so I think we're going to have our alchemy catalyst set up uh, just off to the side of our blood altars here. It is quite a lot of infrastructure to be setting up here at the beginning, but I think it's worth taking the time to do this. And then, uh, yeah, expanding this should be quite easy. We just have to figure out how to do it once. But I guess we'll also need an applied energistics connection over here. And there is a main line running, I think, around here. Yeah, this is the main line from our subnet, which is only using two channels. So in theory, we could have another five P2Ps connected to this. So I think what we'll do is actually run this as straight as possible. And we'll just dig this all the way through. This should line up more or less with our alchemy table room there. Luckily, we do now have a lot of P2P channels that we can use since I rewired this controller. So I think we'll put down our P2P in this room and we'll have 32 channels available just dedicated to these alchemy tables. We'll also need a few channels available for uh, our drawer networks and things as well. So yeah, I think 32 should be fine. And then we can also have another P2P, I guess, for our blood altar setups. But then we can just run some dense cable underneath. And now we can start setting up the inputs for these things. So I think these are actually sided machines in that we have to input from the side, I think, and output from the bottom. All right, in the first table here, we want to make the simple catalysts. So we need glass bottles, redstone, glowstone, gunpowder, sugar, and bronze blend. I think the bronze blend we already create passively. Yeah, it looks like we do already have this on passive. Okay. So we're going to ask for all of these items in this ME interface. Wait, are we not online here? Are we not plugged in? Did I miss a cable somewhere? Oh, I didn't hook up the P2P. Well, that would help. So if we point you towards the alchemy table, are you going to insert? Actually, you know what? I don't think this setup is going to work. We need some way to buffer the items between the alchemy table and the interface. So to fix that, we can use the item buffer from Ender.io. So I guess we'll need five of these things. We're missing RF powder. Wait, RF powder? Uh oh. <laughs> um, why are we missing RF powder? We don't have RF powder because we don't have GP powder. And we don't have GP powder because we don't have GP powder. Okay, I really hope we have a spare GP powder. Otherwise, we're going to have to do some uh, exploration to get some more. Aha, it's in the uh, engineer's workbench here. Oh, I see. I think it was this resonator that was eating all of our GP powder. Or actually, this formulaic assemblicator, since this uses the GP powder to craft polished stone. And we're buffering six stacks of polished stone here. So I think instead of the assemblicator, we're going to use a mechanical crafter now that we have access to these things. We can limit the output inventory here, and we can even keep the same logic settings on the level emitter at the bottom. I think we had this limited to diamonds. Yeah, so it doesn't... It doesn't work unless there's over 64 diamonds in our system. But by now, we should have way more diamonds than that. Yeah, we have 10,000 10, diamonds, so this is probably not necessary. So yeah, this way we can limit the output to just one stack, and then I guess we'll buffer another stack in the resonator. So it's just a bit more efficient to use this crafter. All right, yeah, now we're creating more RF powder. So what these item buffers allow you to do is, well, buffer items. <laughs> so we can place this before our alchemy table, and then we'll place our interface before this. Hold on, <laughs> this isn't the machine I expected this to be. Instead, what we actually want is the impulse hopper, which is the thing I used in interactions. So what the impulse hopper will do is it will only output its items if all of the inputs are full. So we can tell it that we want it to accept one redstone, one glowstone, one sugar, one glass bottle, and one gunpowder. Oh, and I guess the bronze blend. It's going to need a capacitor. And just to keep things a bit neater on top here, we'll put the power underneath. All right, so we're getting power. Now we have to configure the IO to input into the alchemy catalyst, pull from the interface, which now, as you can see, buffers the items in the correct slot. We just need to add bronze blending into the interface. Aha, this is exactly what we're after. So yeah, you can see the impulse hopper has put all the items in the correct slot. All that we're missing for this alchemy table is the blood orb to be able to craft this stuff. But it looks like we've already run out of LP here. So yeah, LP is going to be an issue for a little while, but at least if we set these things up, it's going to be uh, easy to expand in the future. So now we have to deal with the output of these alchemy tables, and um, I think the only output from the bottom. So uh, actually, let me rewire this a little bit. Yeah, so I've hooked up the rest of the alchemy tables with the impulse hoppers and the interfaces, and I also moved over this wire to just clean things up a little bit underneath. As for the outputs on these things, I think we'll output them all to drawers with uh, storage downgrades so that we can control the amount that we have. 
So I think right here we'll set up a little drawer network for these. And then maybe on the other side of this we'll have the, the tier 2 essences being crafted here. And then also input to the same drawer network. Now I think we should tackle the tier 1 essences, which is going to be so fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this. So let's do everyone's favourite thing and <laughs> clear all the pins here. So we want Incendium, Aether, Terra and Aquasalus. Which one should we start with? Um, let's start with the Incendium. So for the Incendium, we already have Pyruthium automated. We have Inferno Bulbs automated. They are in our farm back there. The Lava, we are... We do have automated lava production, but I don't think we're automating the buckets themselves. And as for the nether rack, I don't actually think we're collecting this thing yet. Which should be an easy thing to fix, we can just add it to the filter here on our uh, builder. And I think we already have a nether rack drawer here. Yeah, we do, which is filling up very fast, very, very, very fast. In fact, I think we'll probably end up taking it out before the end of this episode. I did already take out Abyssal Stone from the uh, Dreadlands Miner. So yeah, we can ask for the, those items in the interface, and that just leaves the simple power catalysts, which we'll have to hook up with a storage bus here. So we can just place this on the drawer controller, and then hook this up to our main ME line here. We'll set this for high priority, and just double check all the drawers are locked here. And now we're just missing lava bucket automation. Which we can set up using the Ender IO fluid tank here. It would have been nice to put it on this wall since this is where we've got our lava production. But I don't think we can squeeze much more <laughs> onto this wall here. So what we'll do here is we'll have a fluid interface for lava. Input the lava into the bottom of the tank. And then we can ask for buckets from this interface. And apparently we don't have any buckets left. Oh, <laughs> it's because we're now up to 95 buckets of milk. Didn't we fix that like a, a couple of episodes ago? I'm sure I put a level emitter on this thing. Yeah, I did put a level emitter on this thing. Maybe I have the wrong settings here. No, it looks like everything is correct here. It may have just happened when the ME system went out when I was rewiring the controller over there. I think that's probably what it is. But once this fills the buffer, we should backlog on, on empty buckets. Yeah, now we're getting buckets. So we just have the item conduit filtering into the fluid tank, which we can then output to a drawer above. And conveniently, there's a drawer controller here, so it should connect to the same drawer network. Yeah, so now we're getting lava buckets, which will buffer 32, which should now be everything we need for incendium. So we just have to set the impulse hopper again. And now we're filling the alchemy table. In fact, we can even lock this slot. And again, all we're missing here is the blood orb. All right, so I've hooked up all the interfaces with the items that we need. Uh, there is still a few that we're missing, though. So let's just go through the list, I guess, and we'll tackle those one by one. So for the terra here, we're only missing compressed sand. And actually maybe the dirt as well, since I think this is stuff we have pre-crafted. But the sand we are producing right here is just not all going into a compacting drawer. So, hmm. We could either, we could move this drawer and place a compacting drawer here, but we also get niter, which is actually an important resource that we need. Yeah, I think we'll place a, another compacting drawer here for sand. Oh wait, that's going to give us sandstone. Um, I think we might have to put in the compressed sand first for it to lock to, yeah, for it to lock to that recipe. I think this also means we can take away this trash can up here as we were, yeah, trashing the excess sand because I didn't want to put a void upgrade on the drawer that has niter in it. But now that we have this drawer for sand, we can put the void upgrade on this one. And we'll also replace uh, the double drawer here with just a single one for niter. All right, so that's sand taken care of. I'm going to just empty out this drawer into, into these other ones here. Next, we have to get some dirt. <laughs> and uh, I think with that means we can just add dirt to this quantum quarry. Yeah, we should just be able to take dirt out of the blacklist here. Yeah, we are getting dirt, okay. We just have to make sure there's a drawer here for dirt. And that quantum quarry is connected to this drawer network, so it has to be a compacting drawer here. Hmm, we don't seem to be getting very much dirt out of this quantum quarry. It may be worth also adding it to our builder in the deep dark. Yeah, let's do that. Let's remove it from the void filter on the builder in the deep dark. And this isn't going to give us huge amounts, as it's only scattered in little pockets like this. But hopefully that combined with the quantum quarry will be enough for our blood magic needs. So yeah, that gives us all the materials for Terry or Terra. <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce this thing. Which just leaves the Aether and Aquasalus. For Aquasalus, we already have Dugonia, Water Bottles, and the Simple Catalysts. I keep calling these Simple Power Catalysts. They're just Simple Catalysts. We do also have to find a way of getting Ink Sacks and Lily Pads. We do actually have the lily pads being semi-automated with this resources fissure, but we have to fix the output on this thing, as we are, yeah, filling up on enchanted books and saddles and stuff. So I think for the time being, we're just going to trash the excess enchanted books, and same with the saddles, just so that we can keep this thing running and get the resources that we actually need from it. 
And I guess at this point we should also throw in some speed and energy upgrades in this thing. What is this? Just some, yeah, just some mithril, okay. So that just leaves the ink sacks, which we can either get from squids, or we can get from these ink bush seeds, which is some sort of nether crop. The question is though, I'm not actually sure if we can farm them with this farming station. Since we don't need to rely on canola as much, maybe let's try replace a quadrant uh, with these ink bush seeds. That would be really ideal, as when we smelt this stuff, we can get three ink sacks per. Hmm, okay, it doesn't look like it accepts this as a seed. I wonder if it will work in the plant store though, and maybe we can swap one of these roots crops up to the canola farm. Hmm, doesn't look like it works here either. Okay, <laughs> well in that case, I was going to do a powered spawner so that we could spawn a squid in. But actually, after messing with this ink bush seed, we can bone meal this and then break the block. And it looks like it gives us between one and three ink bush seeds. Just from the little bit that I've tested this. So yeah, instead of doing the boring powered spawner route, <laughs> let's just for fun set up some mechanical users for this. So I think we can have a mechanical user to give it bone meal. And then we can have a block placer maybe, or even a dispenser, I'm not sure yet, to place the bush seed. And then we'll use maybe a block breaker. Hopefully that should work. Just need to give this some power. Yeah, it does work. Cool. And then we just need some, w some way of uh, replenishing the nether rack here. Although it could break it before it's bone mealed. This could get a little bit more complicated than I first thought. Um, maybe I'm overthinking it though. Hold on. Aha, check this out. <laughs> so I found a way to filter this uh, block breaker here. Instead, we're using a scanner, which is set to the full fully grown ink bush, which then emits a redstone signal. And then this is set to active only with the redstone signal. And then we have a block placer here to place back the seed. So obviously this is not a, an ideal location for this. So let's find a little space in the base for this setup. Yeah, <laughs> I think I got this working. So we have the, the same setup. I just moved it over here next to our inscribers. I've added in a pulverizer here, which pulverizes bones into bone meal. And this we're taking from a Applied Energistics interface. And then yeah, it's just set on the same settings. The scanner is set to the ink bush. And then when the block breaker breaks it and gets the ink bush seeds, we have a priority insert on the block placer so that it can place more. And then any excess will go into this drawer here. And once this buffer fills up with the ink seeds, this drawer will start filling up. And then from here, we have to smelt this down into ink sacks. And then we can extract from here and then insert into the smelter. And then we can just place another drawer here for the ink sacks. So this will be input on the left and output on the bottom. And this will also need power somehow. And we can even draw a controller here, and then storage bus on the bottom. And we can even put some upgrades in this mechanical user, to, and this will speed it up quite significantly here. Alright, awesome. <laughs> so now we have to set the drawer for ink sacks, and we can give this a few upgrades as well. So some speed upgrades, and some energy upgrades. Oh yeah, now we're getting ink sacks. <laughs> uh, this turned out quite a bit better than I first thought it would. Nice, so now we're getting ink sacks, which I think is the last component we need for Aquasalus. Yeah, I mean, the, the lily pads we can change to nature essence later on once we unlock mystical agriculture. And the water buckets we already produce. So that just leaves probably the most tricky one, and that is the aether one. So for this we have, we need feathers, and I don't think there's any other way of getting feathers here. Any other clever way anyway. <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a parrot or chicken spawner. And same with the ghasts as well, I think we're going to have to spawn ghasts. Yeah, it looks like it until mystical agriculture. And then there is also aerogel. And this thing, until we get mystical, mystical agriculture, we have to make in the aether. But let's start with the powered spawners, which means we need more quartz burnt, and uh, we should really get round to automating this, but <laughs> I've just been throwing it in this resonator manually for the time being. I mean, it's not difficult to automate, right? It's just blocks of quartz. And same with the sun crystals here. These are also used in the powered spawners, but I've still been doing this stuff manually as well. So which chicken is going to be spawned here? It's going to be the unlucky one. <laughs> we'll take this guy. Hello, Ghast. Can't hit me. Can't hit me. <laughs> Alright, you're gonna be spawned. Ah, we may be able to see the new Ender Crystal automation here. It is just very slow. <laughs> we do have to upgrade the capacitor on this thing. But yeah, the um, the soul vials automatically go in the powered spawner. And then when we request the Ender Crystals, the vibrant crystals just get put in the soul binder. And it looks like we're also crafting the flight control units here. Alright, so we can make our Ghast spawner. I don't think the gas should cause any issues since we have the, the chunks claimed down there. At least I'm hoping they're, they're not going to cause any issues with explosions. I guess there's only one way to find out. The only thing is, I'm not sure if there's any space for our spawners in here. I'm not sure if we put it here, they're going to spawn outside of this room. Which is obviously not what we want. You just have to hook up the redstone logic for this. 
And we can also place down our chicken spawner. So now when we flick our lever, we should see ghasts and chickens being spawned here. Hopefully the ghasts will spawn. Oh, that's not a good sign. No space found. This spawner may take some adjusting here for the ghasts. You know what? It could be because of the string here. May get away with taking away the string and just hope that it doesn't set fire again. As I think that's blocking the last space for the gas to spawn as I think there are five blocks tall. So either we take away the string or we move this all up one block. Let's try and remove the string first. Mm, I don't think we're going to get our gas like this. <laughs> I think we're going to have to move everything up one block. I've moved everything up I think two blocks by now and we're still not getting ghasts. So we could expand out our nether farm. But there is also these little gaslings which I believe also drop gas tiers. And these are going to be much easier to spawn. So let's try swapping out our gas spawner with one of these Carmite gaslings. I guess this also means that we should probably put back the string in this place. Is it working? I can hear them. I don't see them though. <laughs> are we getting ghasts? Oh, we are getting ghasts. That's going to be a problem though. Hmm, how are we going to deal with this? I think we should be able to fix this just by spamming some more mob fans. Which does mean we'll need some more aerogel. And actually this is the last component that we need for our aether. So we'll be automating this next. But these are also used in the mob fan upgrades. Yeah, so we have two more mob fans pushing down. And then two more at the back wall there just to cover the extra extra bit of distance. In fact, these are going to need some height upgrades as well. Yeah, the height upgrade should cover the full length of the room. Since we have the ones at the bottom as well. Aha, now we're getting gaslings. <laughs> this has actually in increased the speed of the mob farm quite significantly as well, as everything gets pushed directly into that mob masher. Oh yeah, this is going to be plenty fast enough. Nice, nice. <laughs> so in order to automate aerogel, I think we're going to use a combination of ender chests and ender tanks. We do now have our ender chests on autocraft, so they're actually not too bad to create here. We do need to have a recipe for the ender tank. Well, this requires a <laughs> tank of blazing pyrothium. Okay, well, I think we're definitely going to want to automate the ender tank production. So what we'll do is we'll add an extra magma crucible and fluid transposer setup, similar to the cryothium and the glowstone here. Except this setup is going to be for blazing pyrothium. So I've just set up exactly the same as the other ones here. We have the pyrothium dust automatically going into the crucible. And then we just need a recipe for the fluid transposer, which we'll put in a empty tank here. And this will be able to fill our blazing pyrothium tank pretty quickly. So now we will have to swap out our recipe here because of the NBT tags. Although it may have to be switched again since I've done that one manually. I'm not entirely sure yet. But this does mean that we can request ender tanks now. We can also set the recipe for the blazing pyrothium tank. We need processing pattern. We want this as the output. And then we'll have the empty tank as the input. And that pattern will go into this interface next to the blazing pyrothium here. So to make aerogel we obviously need lava which is what the ender tanks are for. So... The first one is going to be here where we're going to fill with our lava supply. And the second tank we're going to place in the aether dimension. So in fact, first of all, we need a fluid placer here. And then we can put our ender tank on top. Set this to triple orange, which I think is what the other one is on. And then we can place a mechanical user next to this. And have some blocks so we don't spill lava everywhere. So now if we output the lava, it should automatically get placed. Yep. I wonder why this doesn't get placed into aerogel. Normally if you place lava in the aether dimension it turns into aerogel. I have a feeling this auto placer has something, or this fluid placer has something to do with it. We may need a mechanical user. Yeah, let's try swap this out. Yeah, the mechanical user seems to work here with the, with the lava bucket. So it just means that we have to, instead of supplying the fluid lava, it means we have to supply lava buckets to this mechanical user here. And then we'll have to give this a silk touch pickaxe to mine the block and then something to collect the items. But I think this is something I'll do in between episodes. It shouldn't be too difficult to set the rest of this stuff up. But I am kind of running out of time for today's episode. And we are running very long today. So I think we'll wrap things up here. We actually managed to get all of these essences automated. We just have to find a way to automate the LP generation. And then I think the system's going to be pretty decent. We didn't actually make too much progress through Blood Magic in terms of the quest book, but um, I didn't really want to rush through this page. I think automating this stuff as we unlock it is probably the best way to do this. So yeah, that is going to do us for today. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow for some more Divine Journey 2.